has anybody ever heard of the fleece story then? In the latter part of chapter 6, Gideon st- sets out the fleece. And people use this fleece thing for determining God's will. You put out the fleece and you pray to God, God, if this happens, then I know you mean this, me to do this, this happens, you mean, and they call that putting out the fleece. Was this passage, putting out Gideon putting out the fleece, for Gideon to determine God's will? Did Gideon already know what God's will was? Yes, God had told Gideon what he wanted him to do. He knew what God's will was. The fleece putting out was a test. Was he testing God? Yeah. So, in other words, be careful while this using the fleece to determine God's will. This passage doesn't really, he already knew God's will. This was a test. Now, what did he test God? He said, God, make the fleece wet and the ground dry. In the summer, the dew comes in off the Mediterranean Sea, is warm, and the, and the, and the ground gets cold at night. And so the, basically the Mediterranean moisture comes in and hits the cold land. When it does, it precipitates in dew. But when dew goes on a fleece, what happens? The fleece is like a sponge. Does the sponge stay wetter while the ground dries up? The ground dries up, the water goes right into the ground. So Gideon says, make the fleece wet and the ground dry. Well, that's, is that what normally would happen? So Gideon, not too bright apparently, he says, oh, uh, you know, hey, that's, that's what would normally happen. Oh God, I got one more thing. Uh, this time I want you to make the ground wet and the fleece dry. Now question, is that really tricky? Now that one's tricky because, you know what I'm saying, the, the dew comes down, does the dew cover everything? To make the fleece, which normally holds the water and the ground uh, wet, but the fleece dry, that's a real miracle. I mean, it's all a miracle dealing with God, but it's just, uh, that's pretty incredible. So this passage comes up then about uh, finding the will of God and that kind of thing. And I just want to talk a little bit about finding God's will. Um, kids come into college and stuff. What are you majoring in? What do you want to do with your life? My daughter graduated from Gordon College, and she had no clue on graduation what she wanted to do with her life. It's terrible. And anyway, and so what happened, uh, that seriously, she was about two years out after graduation, she was rummaging around, she's a biblical study major, didn't know what she wanted to do. And after about two years, she said, you know, I think I want to be a nurse practitioner and stuff. And so then she went back and took all this chemistry and stuff, and she now she's a nurse practitioner and things. But what I'm saying is it did take her years after college to figure this stuff out. So... Determining God's will, these are just some abstract guidelines that I would use and stuff myself. First of all, you ask, is it moral? Question, uh, should I go out and steal? Should I go out and lie? Should I go out and cheat? Should I go out and kill somebody? The answer is no, those are moral, they're wrong, okay? So in other words, is it moral? Is it God's, in God's will uh, that he stated, you know, lying is wrong, cheating is wrong, that kind of stuff, so the moral will. So I know I don't have to ask myself that, okay? Um, the question I ask myself quite frequently is, what is the good? I'm an old man. I'm looking at the end of life. I'm saying, what is the mostest, goodest I can do is the quickest? Okay? You know, it's, you know what, what, what is the most good I can do? And every day I get up with this question, what is the most good I can do for this day? And uh, so you ask, what is, what is the good? What is the good that I can do? Now, pursue your passions. Each of us have different interests and things, and you need to pursue your things that you're interested in, that you're passionate about, and you hope that that can coalesce. What are you gifted in? What are you gifted in? What, where, what, is, what is your weirdness? What is your, your gift, your creativity? What, what really gets you going? Uh, what are your gifts and things? And follow those things. And um, then you ask also, what do I feel God's calling me to do? And there's, there comes a sense of God's calling in your life, but... You know, sometimes you can't figure these things out very well. Um, let me just give you an example. When I was in college, I went through for electrical engineering and mathematics, okay? That was my undergraduate degree. After I finished in January, I went to seminary, right? When I went to seminary, what did I study? Abstract algebra, complex variables in seminary? No, I studied Greek and Hebrew, okay, and all these things. Okay, when I got to seminary, I found out I love studying scripture and things. And after I graduated from seminary, and went on to graduate school after that, I thought, God, I wasted three years out of my life, three and a half years out of my life. I was killing myself, going to school, taking 20 hours of engineering courses, working 20, 30, 40 hours a week and stuff. I killed myself going through college. I said, God, I wasted my, I, all, that, all that work that I put in there was totally wasted. And now I'm doing Bible. What does Bible have to do with electrical engineering and things? All of a sudden, about 10 years, 15 years later, it's in the late 80s, and I picked up what a thing was called a PC. And I said, holy cow, 
this is like 10 times easier than it used to be. And it was like, whoa, you could do all this stuff on this PC. And then what happened? So then I started doing all this computer stuff. And question, am I able to do biblical studies and computer stuff? And by the way, do you guys benefit from that? Because what happens? You got all this stuff up, you got audio, you got text and stuff like that. How much do you, you pay 10 bucks for this stuff? If you buy a textbook in here, what, everybody in here saved you about 50 bucks to 75 bucks because we can do this stuff online now. Can we do really cool stuff online? Yeah. But what I'm saying is there was about a 10 to 15 year period of my life where I said I can't, couldn't figure out what God was doing. And it was, it was like I wasted my, a huge part of my life and I couldn't figure that out. What I'm saying is you may think that you can't figure out what God's done in your life. But what I'm saying is if you give it time over time, 10, 15, 20 years later, all of a sudden the light bulb will go on. And you'll say, oh, stink, that's what was going on. And I never understood the connection. And what, what I see happening is that God takes the things that you think are the biggest, like, problems, and he turns them. Do you remember Joseph's statement? You meant it to me for evil, but God meant it for good. And so you, you see this redemptive work of God where God takes the things that are the most mucked up things in our life, and he, and he turns them. And the biggest problem we end up having turns out to be God uses that in spectacular ways to, for his goodness and for his greatness. And we, we know then that it's God doing it. It's not us doing it. God has redemptively touched us in a way that's made us... Uh, so just some things to think about with this. Open and close doors. You know what I'm saying? God opens doors, other doors are closed, okay? One of the biggest things I think for people is failure, is failure one of your best friends. Failure is really, really important to know how to handle failure. Failure can be one of the biggest blessings in your life. I always remember, you guys remember the story of Michael Jordan, okay? Does anybody remember Michael Jordan? This guy who played basketball in the 90s and stuff like that. I used to, I never watched professional sports, but I watched Michael Jordan because I, I honestly, I played in college, Houghton College, and I, I just, it was like I never saw anybody, and I never saw anybody that could do what I, every game, man. I just, how can he do that stuff? It's impossible. And, and Michael Jordan got cut from his high school basketball team Michael Jordan got cut from his baseball basketball team. And what I'm saying is, how do you deal with failure? How do you deal with failure? Failure can really, it's really important. Open and closed doors. How do you handle the open and closed doors? And then let me pull a thing from Henry Nouwen. Uh, he talks about prayer. And he says, when you pray, you have to pray with open hands. If you pray like this, you don't pray like this. You're talking to God. You pray with open hands. And God puts things in your hands. It's his grace. It's his grace. And so a lot of life is praying with open hands. You can't demand. You can't demand stuff. Things that you think are going to work out beautifully and things like that. You hold things with an open hand. And God places, he's, his, his, as Niles Logue used to say, God puts bouquets of grace in your hands. You can't clutch them. He puts them as gifts in your hand and stuff. So that's to do with Gideon. Now, uh, we've got our next big one is Gideon and Midian. Let me just finish out Gideon, and we'll call it a day. Uh, Gideon gets the battle, and Gideon goes out to fight. What happens? God's going to give him the victory. Let me just narrate the story here. Chapter 7, the Gideon and Midian thing. What happens here? Gideon goes out. He gets like 32,000 guys. Do you want a large army or a small army to be victorious? You want the largest army possible. God looks at it and says, Gideon, you got too many guys. He says, too many warriors. If, if, if you win the battle, you're going to think it's because you won the battle. And he says, I want you to know that it's, I'm the one who's winning the battle. So anyone who's fearful, let them go home. Anyone who's fearful, let them go home. Are people fearful in war contexts? Are people fearful in war contexts? Is a war context threatening? I could tell you a story about Hadley, my, one of my son's best friend. Hadley was fearless, knew no fear had been to Iraq, knew no fear. That's my son, who's one of his closest friends. This guy knew no fear. He goes to Afghanistan. He was shot through the neck. It missed his major artery here by a millimeter, and he would have been dead. Hadley took, was, it was a month or two off. I forget, whatever. They patched him up. He came back. When he came back to battle, question, did he know fear? Yeah. After that, after having been shot through his neck, all of a sudden, it was, whoa, when you go out there again, this is, uh, you get shot to the neck again, this is not good, and things. And so what I'm saying is fear and battle, the fear, all will go home. What happens? 22,000 leave. 
He's left with, I don't know, 10,000 or something like that now. God takes him down to drink. And he says, basically, to drink, it's hot climbing and stuff. All the guys that dump their head in the water and lap just out of the water, let them go home. How do most people, when they're, they're really thirsty and stuff, so they dive into the spring and get it head first? He says, the ones that bring it up, like bring it up and lap to their mouth, those are the ones I want. How many were there? 300. All the rest, thousands go home. Gideon has 300. Okay, sounds like the 300 or something. Okay. Now, some people say Gideon is wanting a few good men. Is that what God was trying to do, get a few good men? The answer is no, that's exactly the opposite of point of this story. Was God trying to get a few good men to show that a few good men can win the victory? No, he was trying to show them who is going to win the victory. He was going to win the victory. It's not these few good men. So what they do is they basically go around and they surround the Midianites and they've got this lamp full of olive oil with a wick on it ready to burn and they've got trumpets and 300 guys surround them. The Midianites, by the way, are a complex of, uh, what do they call those, mercenaries. Okay, so there's mercenaries mixed in with these guys. Gideon surrounds them. They break the, it's kind of like a Maltoff cocktail. They break the Maltoff cocktail. Everything goes up in fire. They blow the trumpets and the Midianites figure they're surrounded and they start fighting each other. Then the army breaks down and the guys kill each other and Gideon wins the battle with three, 300 guys. They win the battle. They take them all out. Who won the battle that day? The Lord won the battle and the Lord was his. And so, um, okay. We'll call it quits there. I think that clock is slow and we'll finish that up next time. So.